Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right, happy Tuesday. Um, so my colleague, Admiral John Kirby, is here today to answer any questions on um, about the President, President Putin, President Xi meeting in Moscow uh, today. And so and any other questions that you may all have on foreign policy, he'll be happy to take them. Kirby, the podium is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I know there's a, <laughs> I know there's been a lot of interest uh, around the meeting between President Xi, Pre President Putin, and Moscow today. Um, so we'll get at that. I just wanted to stop by and um, be available to you for that. Uh, before I do, uh, I do want to quickly speak to the joint statement between the PRC and Russia uh, that they put out today on deepening their cooperation, including on Ukraine. On Ukraine. I would note that the two sides just said, quote, the purposes and principles of the UN Charter must be observed and international law must be respected. Well, we agree. Following the UN Charter would mean that Russia should withdraw from all the territory inside Ukraine, uh, the territory of another member state of the UN, a member that it has invaded. The UN Charter enshrines the principles of respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries, including Ukraine. And they also said, quote, parties, the parties call for the cessation of all steps that contribute to escalation of tension and the prolongation of hostilities. We agree. One way to stop the hostilities is to pull Russian troops out of Ukraine. But short of that, Mr. Putin could stop bombing hospitals. He could stop bombing schools. He could stop launching Iranian drones into civilian infrastructure. He could stop the forcible deportation of young kids, thousands of them, putting them in filtration camps inside other places inside Ukraine, but also inside Russia. Um, and he could stop reducing cities like Bakhmut to bricks, to piles of bricks. That is a way to stop the prolongation of hostilities. So now if China wants to play a constructive role here in this conflict, then they ought to press Russia to pull its troops out of Ukraine and Ukrainian sovereign territory. They should urge, urge President Putin to cease bombing cities, hospitals, and schools to stop the war crimes and the atrocities and end the war today. It could happen right now. Now, with that, I'll take some questions. The, uh, yeah, yeah. the, the statement also says the Russian side speaks positively <laughs> of China's objective and impartial position on the Ukraine issue. Do you see China as having an impartial position on this? No, we don't. How do you interpret this statement? Then? Well, I, certainly I'm, I'm not going to do a book review on their statement. They can do that. Uh, they can spot, speak to their words. But I don't think you can reasonably look uh, at, at China as impartial in any way. Um, they haven't condemned this, uh, in, uh, this invasion. Um, they haven't stopped buying Russian oil and Russian energy. Um, President Xi saw fit to fly all the way to Moscow, hasn't talked once to President Zelensky, hasn't visited Ukraine, hasn't bothered to uh, avail himself of the Ukrainian objective, and uh, he and his regime keeps parroting the Russian propaganda that this is somehow the, a, a war of the West on Russia, that it's some sort of existential threat to Mr. Putin. That's just a bunch of malarkey. Ukraine posed no threat to anybody, let alone Russia. So no, it, it, it can't be seen that, that Russia is impartial. Now look, um, if, uh, if he's uh, willing to talk to President Zelensky um, and willing to get the other side, um, and, uh, and, and we, you know, if, if any future potential negotiation can incorporate uh, Ukrainian views and perspectives uh, and can be achieved and, and, and uh, pursued with Ukraine, as, as President Biden has said, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, if, if that's the direction, then that's something that uh, that could be seen as as uh, as impartial. But I just don't think right now that they can be seen that way. And lastly, are we watching a budding alliance between China and Russia here? I think you've seen over years now these two con countries going, going growing close together. Peter asked a question similar to that yesterday. Um, um, I wouldn't go so far to call it an alliance. Yesterday I called it a marriage of convenience because that's what I think it is. Uh, in President Putin and Russia, President Xi sees. Uh, um, a counterweight to American influence uh, and, uh, and NATO influence, certainly on the continent and elsewhere around the world. In President Xi, President Putin sees uh, a potential backer here. Th this is a man who doesn't have a whole lot of friends on the international stage. 
they can count him on one hand mostly. And he really needs and wants President Xi's support for what he's trying to do because he's running through, he's blowing through inventory, he's blowing through manpower, his military is getting embarrassed constantly. They've lost greater than 50 percent of the territory that they took in the first few months of this war. He needs help from President Xi, and that's what this visit was all about. Now, whether it results in anything, we'll see. Good, John, uh, two questions for you. Yeah. Is the U.S. aware if there has now been an official request from Putin to Xi for lethal aid to be used in Ukraine? I can only go by what we've seen them say today, um, uh, which, which obviously was not part of their, uh, at least part of the readout and part of the statements they put out today. I would tell you what I said yesterday and remains true. We don't think that China's taken it off the table, but they haven't moved in, in that direction. We've seen no indication that they're about to or uh, or fixing to, to provide lethal weapons. Okay. Um, and my second question, um, the president considers Vladimir Putin to be a war criminal. I'm just wondering what it means to President Biden that Putin calls <coughs> Xi Jinping a friend. I don't think we're uh, overly uh, exercised about uh, uh, that comment. I mean, these are it wasn't that long ago, MJ, where they were talking about a relationship without limits, right? Partnership without limits. Uh, so we're not going to get all hot and bothered about the use of friends. What what we've seen is these are two countries that are growing closer together, um, that see in each other uh, useful purposes for pushing back, as I said yesterday, for chafing and bristling um, at uh, a, a rules-based order around the world. They want to change the rules of that game. In fact, they would love nothing better, both countries, to, to see uh, uh, the, the rest of the world play by their rules uh, rather than the ones that, uh, that are enshrined in the UN Charter and what everybody else is, uh, is following. Um, so that's what's going on here. Just, John, to clarify one thing, this is what Steve asked you. It is, regarding the statement, the Russian side speaks positively of China's objective and impartial position on the Ukraine issue. It is the view of this government that China is no longer impartial or is not impartial when it we comes never to said we never said china was an impartial participant uh, here does that and does this statement does this meeting improve or make it more difficult for president biden to ever meet again with president xi at least anytime soon president so biden the president wants to keep the lines of communication open with china nothing's changed about that and as i said yesterday at the appropriate time uh, we'll pursue another conversation with President Xi. And in a semi-related matter, the president of Taiwan has now announced their plans to come uh, to the United States briefly and then head to Central America. Are there any plans for any U.S. officials to meet with the president of Taiwan when they're in the United States? This is, as you know, these are called transits, uh, not uncommon. Uh, president Tsai has uh, done it six times. Um, every single <laughs> Taiwan president in uh, recent memory has done this. Um, it is unofficial and personal in nature in terms of travel. Uh, so we would let them speak to their agenda to, uh, uh, to uh, who uh, they want to meet with and, and, uh, and on uh, what timeline. It is not uncommon uh, for uh, in previous transits uh, for there to be discussions with, uh, with U.S. officials and with members of Congress. But again, I'm not going to get ahead. This is really for uh, uh, Taiwan to speak to. This is for Taiwan to speak to. Good job. Uh, thank you, Green. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, on the idea of Russia seeking weapons and munitions, can you give us an assessment right now as to where things stand in terms of their weapons stockpile, Russia's weapons stockpile, and what sort of help are they getting at this moment from places like Iran and North Korea? Well, we know that they um, have a burgeoning defense relationship with Iran. Uh, we already know that they, Iran has provided several hundred drones. Um, and we have every reason to suspect that that sort of transaction will continue. I don't have any specific shipments to speak to today, but we know that this relationship from a defense perspective with those two countries is, is getting uh, sharper. I came to the podium and talked about that. And that's a worry not just for the people of Ukraine. It's a worry for the people of the Middle East. Uh, and Iran that can avail itself of Russian military capabilities uh, would make it more lethal and more dangerous in, in the region. Um, uh, we did talk about the, the fact that we had evidence that uh, North Korea was shipping at the very least artillery shells to the Wagner Group. We still believe that uh, uh, that, uh, that that occurred. Uh, I don't have any additional shipments of, of things to speak to. Um, uh, but again, I think it speaks volumes to your question about inventory. And I, <clears throat> I couldn't give you uh, a, ru a rundown of Russian inventory on, on any given uh, type of system. 
but they have gone through thousands uh, of missiles and most likely millions uh, of artillery shells. Uh, they have lost uh, easily tens of thousands of, of troops uh, and, and probably north of 100,000 uh, in terms of killed and wounded. Um, uh, so it, this has not been uh, a fight Mr. Putin has had without cost to his country uh, and to his coffers. Um, and so he continually wants to reach out for more help uh, internationally. That's what we're seeing with Iran, so we saw with North Korea. And, and there's no question uh, that's, what, that's what we're seeing in his interest in talking to President Xi. Uh, but we know that this, we know this war has had an effect on his inventory. And we also know, Jonathan, um, that the sanctions and export controls have had an effect on him, particularly when it comes to cruise missiles, that his ability to restock cruise missiles out of the inventory has been curtailed by the fact that he can't get to some of the microelectronics because of the, the economic steps that this administration has taken to, to kind of curb his war-making machine. So um, uh, this, this is a guy, you know, for all the bally who are going to uh, Mariupol, I mean, this is a guy who, who has to know uh, that his military is way underperforming um, and and uh, overspending in terms of its ability, its its resource ability. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to follow on Ed's last question. You guys have obviously made this concerted effort to, ahead of the visit of the Taiwanese president, um, sort of downplay it as not uncommon, not intended as a provocation. Not downplaying. It's true. It's not uncommon. They they have happened before. It's not about downplaying. It's about being factual. All right, well, there has been this sort of concerted effort, and I'm, my question is that if, do, does that not sort of tacitly acknowledge concern within the administration that China may overreact, or I assume you think it was an overreaction to uh, this visit, and I was wondering if you can play out to some extent what that level of concern is and how the U.S. would react if we see you know, a policy redox in, in how they interpret this. There's no reason for China to overreact. Heck, there's no reason for him to react. I mean, this is something that, um, uh, that as I said, uh, is commonplace uh, and has happened before, will likely happen again. It's personal. It's unofficial. There should be no reason for uh, Beijing to, uh, uh, to react in any way to this. Uh, again, business as usual here. And uh, we did think it was important to provide that context in light of uh, uh, Mr. She's visit to, to Moscow and all the media attention that that is getting, um, uh, as well as in the context of uh, of how they reacted to, to Speaker Pelosi's. No apologies there at all. Uh, we felt that, that this was important context to be out there, and so we, we put it out there. But is it because you are concerned about the Chinese reaction? I, it's one thing to say, yeah, we hope they don't react in any way. It's another to be like, they really shouldn't. We just felt it was important to put it in proper context. Thanks a lot, Kareem. Uh, right over here, John. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a big room. I have to keep up with our fingers. <laughs> the, the war in Ukraine's been going on for over a year now. Is it the U.S. position that during the course of all of that time that China has not provided any lethal weaponry to Russia? We have seen that through some Chinese companies, uh, uh, there, uh, uh, there may have been dual-use items uh, that have uh, gone, uh, but we haven't seen any confirmation or indication that the Chinese have provided lethal weapons, lethal capabilities to the Russian Ministry of Defense uh, throughout this conflict. They have not done that. And obviously, as I said yesterday, we don't think it's in their best interest to do that. And quite frankly, it would be inconsistent with so, so many of the things that President Xi has said uh, that he wants to see as a result of this war in Ukraine, including their statements today. Why do you think that's the case? Why do you think that they have uh, not done that yet? And do you think it has a lot to do with what President Biden has told President Xi, what EU leaders have told the, uh, President Xi, and that is if they do so, they risk <coughs> major sanctions being placed upon them by not only the U.S., but also by the EU, their two largest trading partners? I certainly can't speak for President Xi. That's well beyond my writ. Um, what I would say is we have communicated privately to the Chinese, um, and you've heard Secretary Blinken talk about this. We've also said it publicly uh, that uh, that such a move would would, uh, would would certainly involve consequences. But more importantly, uh, we believe, and we've said this too, that that that, that 
this shouldn't be seen by the Chinese as something that's in their best interest, to help Mr. Putin slaughter more innocent Ukrainians, to, what's the word they use, the escalation of tension and prolongation of hostilities? Well, that's one way to do that. And uh, again, if, if we're taking them at their word, or what they want to see happen, it's hard to square the circle between that, that statement, and the provision of, of lethal weapons. So we don't believe it's in their best interest. Uh, a, a country like China that has a very powerful economy and um, and uh, and uh, does have uh, influence around the world to want to see that uh, that influence stained by helping Mr. Putin uh, murder more Ukrainians. Thanks, Brian, in the back. Thanks, uh, John. I guess the uh, <coughs> over here. Thanks. <laughs> Follow up to that question: Is there any indication that the uh, visitation by Xi to uh, Putin? could lead to a de-escalation. Have you all seen anything that the statement that they put out about de-escalation, in fact, was a warning to Russia? And we're still working our way through the language here. Um, so I, I don't want to get into a, a deep analysis. But coming out of what we've seen today, we haven't seen anything that they've said, they put forward, um, that, that gives us hope that this war is going to end anytime soon. As a matter of fact, Mr. Putin said something to the effect today, or his spokesman Peskov, I think, said something to the effect today that that they are willing to negotiate, but it's the West and the Ukraine that is refusing, which of course is absolutely false. So I, we've seen no. Uh, I don't think the meeting today gives us great expectations that the war is going to end anytime soon. And then as a quick follow-up to that, is there any indication? that we would be willing to talk with, or let me put it another way, is there any indication that Russia is showing any signs that they would back off at any point in time? Are they still, you know, guns blazing? No sign at all that Mr. Putin is changing his calculus. Thank you. John, uh, about the bill President Biden signed yesterday, he says he will declassify COVID origins intel except info that would harm national security. Is there a bigger national security threat than something that killed 1.1 yeah. million people yeah, in I've this country? Yeah, I've seen, I've seen some of the commentary uh, on your network about this. Uh, the president obviously has to balance transparency with national security. Peter, of course he does. Um, right when coming into office, ordered the declassification of what the DNI had on COVID origins ordered the entire intelligence community and added the Department of Energy to that list. Uh, and where is it? Hey, let me finish my answer. If we're talking about the beginning added of Added the his Department term. of Energy and the National Labs, told them to keep studying it. Um, we have kept Congress informed. Some of that has to be in a classified way right now. But it's always a balance between the, uh, the public's right to know, right, not need, but right, and our obligation to protect national security. So uh, one should not read into that statement that he's sort of laying a foundation here uh, to be overly secretive. He believes strongly that we've got to find the, the roots and the origins of COVID so that we can prevent a future pandemic. And through his actions, just judge him on what he's done, through his actions, he's proven that he's willing to be as transparent as possible with the American people because he believes that's important. Then does the White House hope that the lab leak theory is not true. We don't have a hope one way or the other, Peter. What we want is the ground truth. Wherever that takes us, wherever the science takes you, wherever the facts takes you, President Biden wants to know so that he can help work with the scientific community to prevent a future pandemic. We're not, there, there, there's no thumb on the scale here, Peter. It's not about uh, not wanting a certain outcome. We just want the best possible outcome that we can get. Okay. And just quickly about the meeting today, uh, the Xi-Putin meeting. In November, when President Biden met with Xi, he said, I want to make sure that every country abides by the international rules of the road. Does he think China is abiding by the international rules of the road? In some cases, we have significant concerns uh, about uh, China's behavior, particularly their coercive and aggressive behavior, for instance, in the South China Sea and pursuing false maritime claims, um, concerns about intellectual theft. Um, and some trade practices. And the president's been very open and honest about that, and he was when they met in, in, in Bali. Uh, but there are other areas where we believe there's room for a cooperation uh, with China, and we're, we want to be able to pursue that too. But in order to do that, Peter, 
you got to keep those lines of communication open. You got to have that ability uh, to talk, particularly when things are tense like they are right now. And that's what the, the president wants to get back to. Thanks, Kirby. Um, thanks, Kirby. Uh, in that joint statement today, Russia and China warned against the war transitioning to a quote uncontrollable phase. Ukraine is preparing a counteroffensive. Does the U.S. see that part of the joint statement from Russia and China as a specific warning to to Ukraine and the West? It's difficult to know what they mean by an uncontrollable phase. Uh, certainly, we noted that language ourselves. Um, I, I can't tell you for sure that we know exactly what they're referring to. I will not. I will not speak uh, ever about future operations, particularly for the Ukrainians. That's for them to speak to, and I, I wouldn't get ahead of anything that they might or might not do. We do know that President Putin uh, is making plans to go back on the offense. I mean, he's already he's got Wagner uh, continuing to throw literally human flesh into Bakhmut to try to, to take that town. Um, and uh, we have every expectation that he's going to plan for all other offensive operations as the weather gets better. What we want to make sure we're doing and we just announced another package yesterday, is that Ukraine is ready to defend themselves against those offensive operations, and if they choose to, be able to conduct offensive operations of their own. And to follow on that potential Ukrainian offensive, does she support for Putin increase the stakes of any potential Ukrainian offensive? It would depend on what that support looked like. I mean, uh, th does his visit to Moscow, uh, I, I think it's hard to get to there. I think it's hard to square that circle just by going to Moscow and proclaiming that they're dear friends. Uh, but if uh, but if the, if the tangible uh, support changes, certainly if it changes in a lethal way, then obviously that would be additive to Russian uh, military capabilities, which of course would, we would all have to take seriously. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, and John, thanks for doing this on uh, back-to-back days. Um, today marks the 100th day of the eco-protests along the Latin Corridor in the Karabakh region between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So I've got two questions on that. First of all, um, what is the administration's position on the ongoing conflict? And does, uh, does the U.S. view the presence of 2,000 Russian soldiers in the Karabakh region as a cause for concern? I would just, uh, broadly speaking, uh, 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 what we've said before is we, uh, we urge uh, all sides here to de-escalate. We don't want to see uh, any of this uh, violence, and we want to see all sides take, take appropriate steps uh, to de-escalate the tension and to, uh, and to stop the violence. But beyond that, I'm really not prepared to go today. And what, what about the Russian troop presence? I'm not prepared that to go beyond that today. Good. Thanks, Green. Thanks, Kirby. I wanted to ask about the upcoming trip to Canada and what does the president plan to bring up? Is he prepared to talk about the problems the Canadians are having at the northern border? But is he also concerned that Canada is behind on its uh, contributions to NATO, especially as the war in Ukraine goes on? I, I think we're going to have more to talk about the uh, tomorrow on this, so I don't want to get too far ahead of where we are. Uh, uh, Canada, as you know, is not only a, a neighbor to the north but a NATO ally. Uh, and the President and Prime Minister Trudeau have a terrific uh, relationship. He's looking forward to getting up there. There are a range of issues uh, that you can imagine they'll talk about, everything from NORAD and modernization of NORAD capabilities, as well as, of course, I think, uh, uh, the military the security and national security issues are writ large, uh, migration concerns, climate change. Uh, there'll be certainly issues of trade to discuss. There's a lot, but I, I think we'll have more to say about that tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Karine. Um, Mr. Kirby, Annie Lee, to um, I, uh, yesterday when you were here, you were asked about Harris, um, Vice President Harris's trip to Africa, and you said that it's a trip that's a, about Africa. Um, but it's also a part of the country, or part of the, um, the world, where the Chinese have been investing billions upon billions of dollars. Yeah. And can you talk at all about whether countering that influence is important at all to the administration? Our focus on the continent is, as I said yesterday, about the continent. And we're mindful, of course, of uh, Chinese efforts to uh, improve uh, and deepen uh, their involvement uh, in Africa, Latin America, uh, and elsewhere around the world. And one of the things that came out of the African Leaders Summit uh, was a growing recognition that we perceived by African leaders that they're beginning to realize uh, that uh, China's not really their friend. Uh, they, they get these loans, high interest, can't pay them. China says, hey, bill's coming due. So I guess I'm going to take this and this and this from you. And, and that's starting to happen uh, across the continent. And African leaders are beginning to see uh, that, that China's interests in the, in the region are purely selfish. 
as opposed to the United States, we are truly committed to trying to help uh, our African friends deal with a spate of challenges, food insecurity, energy insecurity, both of which, by the way, have been drastically exacerbated by this war in Ukraine by Mr. Putin, contrary to what Foreign Minister Lavrov would say. Counterterrorism, where we are still partnering with some of our African uh, partners to go after terrorist networks. Climate change, I could go on and on. Um, and that's why the president, coming out of that summit, assigned uh, Johnny Carson's as the implementer. An implementer, a guy whose whole job is to go out and take all the things we talked about in the summit and make it true. Um, and part of that, of course, is going to be principal level travel. And the, uh, the vice president will be uh, having discussions with um, African leaders on all those issues when she travels. And she's very much looking forward to that. Good. I have a follow up on the African trip. Um, in countering China's influence on the continent, is the vice president going to take on some of the human rights issues? that are present in Ghana and Tanzania and in Zambia, um, because that's something that we know that China does not do as, as a matter of policy. How is she going to negotiate we, that difficult position? The vice president will, of course, raise uh, human rights concerns everywhere she goes. That's, that's uh, a part and parcel of, uh, of American leadership around the world. We're not afraid. In fact, it's a sign of, of how much we care about other nations and partnerships uh, that we are able and willing to have those kinds of conversations. So of course, of course, she will raise human rights concerns appropriately everywhere she goes. Publicly? Or that, no, I won't get ahead of the vice president's meetings or uh, how she's going to, to couch this, but of, of course, that's uh, part and parcel of every conversation that we have with foreign leaders around the world. It has to be. Can I follow up on something you just said about China's ability to be impartial? You just said if China can truly be impartial, and Ukraine is on board for talks. Uh, is that something that the U.S. would support if Ukraine were interested in China brokered talks? We, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. If President Zelensky, if there's a path put forward that President Zelensky can get behind and that he believes uh, will help lead to a, a just peace, as he refers to it, uh, then he'll find no better friend in that effort than the United States. Yeah. This is going to be Big a agree. Very Hi, John. ten months, not a single Wait, opportunity is given. This is not how it works. This is not how it works, sir. This is not how it works. Go ahead. Hi, John. Uh, today, the Ugandan parliament yes. okay. uh, voted in favor of an anti homosexuality bill, um, and it's set to host a summit uh, soon. Can you talk about the homosexuality bill? And it's set to host a summit soon with other African nations on potentially passing other bills across the continent. Um, it's my understanding that Ambassador Thomas Greenfield uh, spoke to the Ugandan president about this bill. I, I, I ask this question because I, sources tell me that Russia uh, may be playing a major role in the influence of this larger anti-LGBTQ movement and is using it as a wedge between the U.S. and Africa. Uh, considering the U.S. is currently engaging with Africa on other issues, um, is this a concern for the U.S.? Oh, it, of course it is. I mean, and President Biden has been uh, nothing but consistent uh, about his uh, belief, foundational belief in human rights, and LGBTQ plus rights are human rights. Uh, and uh, we, again, back to the earlier question, are never going to shy away, be bashful about speaking up for those rights and for, uh, uh, for individuals to live as they deem fit, as they want to live. And that's something that's a core part of our foreign policy, and it, and it will remain so. Go ahead in the back. Go ahead. Uh, to follow up on, on what you said yesterday on, the, on Iraq, on the anniversary, is there a message for the, some of us who are actually there and remember to the families, the 4,000 men that lost their lives, the 35,000 injured, and the 2.5 two million that served? And then second, uh, Japan is hosting the upcoming G7 in Hiroshima. Uh, the Japanese Prime Minister is currently in Ukraine. This is a big step for Japan. Um, are there some ways that Japan, uh, Japan holds, holds the largest number of U.S. military in the world? And as a partner, um, what role do you think they can play, at, especially with the upcoming summit, to be part of um, the partnership going forward? And then finally, uh, the Japanese is the biggest partner. They've never had an interview with the uh, President, yeah. So hopefully before the summit, if that can be worked out. Thank you. Maybe before the end of the briefing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will defer to uh, uh, to Kareen on issues of interviews with the president. That's that's that that's your job, not mine. Um, uh, uh, look on on your second issue. Uh, uh, I think you saw. Uh, Mr. Sullivan uh, put out a short tweet about this. Uh, we welcome uh, the Prime Minister's visit to Kyiv. It's another example 
uh, of just how strongly Japan is standing up with the rest of the international community to support Ukraine. Uh, and, and certainly as a close ally of the United States, we're very appreciative of all the things that J Japan continues to do, not just in supporting Ukraine, but in uh, promoting security and stability in the Indo-Pacific. I mean, they have rewritten their national security strategy. They have taken uh, a more assertive role in terms of uh, uh, se uh, security operations, uh, and all that's, uh, all that's to the good, and we're very grateful for that. On OIF, I don't know that I have more than I can say uh, than, than yesterday for uh, some, some of you, I'm sure, maybe covered the war and um, uh, saw m more of, of combat than, than you probably care to remember. And, of course, we know, as I said yesterday, so many families here in the United States are still living with the war. The war is not over for them. Uh, and we all, need to, we all need to keep that in mind. Okay, Thank you. Um, I, also, I also have an African question. President Putin said that he will write off uh, debt for African countries of over $20 billion, just a substantial amount of money. And he said that Russia will meet its commitment to provide them with food supply and energy, etc. You think this is, comes in the equation of the Russia-Ukraine war and trying to sway Ukraine over the vote, especially in the UN? And do you think the US is doing enough to counter Russia's influence, not just China? Russia's I think this is a cynical effort by Mr. Putin to try to convince uh, nations in Africa that um, that uh, the West is the reason for their food insecurity and for their energy insecurity. And if I was any leader in Africa, I would take anything that President Putin says about assurances of financial, economic, or energy assistance with a huge grain of salt. I mean, it, it is Mr. Putin's war that has contributed to the food insecurity on the continent. It's his war that has contributed to the energy insecurity uh, uh, on the continent. Uh, and he might like to gloss over that and send Foreign Minister Lavrov on field trips all over Africa to say that it's the West fault or it's the United States fault, but it's not. It, has, it can be tied directly. Now, it's also due to drought, climate change, and uh, you know, even domestic instability. I don't want to overstate other factors here, but don't make no mistake, his war in Ukraine is having these kinds of effects uh, on the African continent. And if he's serious about addressing it, if he's serious about winning over African audiences, uh, uh, about making things better, rather than throwing out false promises of, of loan relief, he ought to just pull his troops out of Ukraine. Then, if there's no war, energy and food insecurity will be a, a lot less uh, worrisome for everybody. Way in the back, way in the back. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks. The, um, the bill that the president signed yesterday on, on COVID origins, it calls for the declassification within 90 days. Can you give us a better sense as to when that information will actually be declassified? Are we talking about days, weeks, months? I, I can't give you a, a date certain right now. Uh, I mean, he just signed this yesterday. We're mindful of what the legislation says in terms of the 90-day time, time frame. Um, we'll work on this as diligently as we have been working on it, and we'll be fully transparent with the American people, again, appropriately to our own national security concerns. Uh, but I couldn't give you a date certain on the calendar. When it's out there, people will be able to see it for themselves and form their own opinion. At, at this point, has the president formed an opinion as to what he thinks happened? He no, think he has happened? not. Nor would he. Why would he? He wouldn't form an opinion before uh, he has access to, uh, you know, m more and more intelligence about, about what happened. I'll tell you what he has formed an opinion on, and that is that it's important uh, that we get to the roots of it so that we can prevent another pandemic, and that, um, that scientific research labs, who do important work, uh, also know that they need to be as accountable and transparent as they can be uh, with the research that they're conducting. That he has formed a strong opinion on, but he's made no conclusions, nor would he, until, uh, until more information is available. Thank you, Admiral. Appreciate it. In the back here. Thank you. I'd like <laughs> If I, may, once when he was in the okay, if I may turn your attention to Nicaragua, sir. Uh, Nicaragua. <clears throat> okay. Nicaragua is my, is my question. Okay. So you may know that uh, Daniel Ortega recently threw into prison Bishop Rolando Alvarez, well known, well respected bishop throughout the world, but in Nicaragua, that's where he was, uh, he, where he was bishop. He was thrown in prison for 26 years on trumped-up charges. 
the question one, are you aware of any efforts the U.S. is making to free Rolando Alvarez? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to take the question and, and get back to you, sir. I'm not tracking that particular okay. case. Would you have, would the Biden administration have any message for the Ortega regime that continues to persecute Catholics in that country? We have been uh, uh, clear and consistent with nations all over the world about the uh, the importance of religious freedom and proper human rights and civil rights uh, for not only uh, their citizens, but certainly for ours as they travel abroad. But I don't have any more specific on that. Okay, two more. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Admiral, uh, you, you talked about how Russia's forces are going through ammunition, going through personnel. We, we've seen reports about them um, increasing the, the draft to get more soldiers. At, at what point? Do they start run? Do they start running out of ammunition? I mean, do you have an assessment on how long they can continue what they're doing before either someone resupplies them or they they have to? I think you can them. see in his own efforts, right, to hire Wagner, and for Wagner and Mr. Prigozhin actually bragging about going to prisons and getting more more convicts. I think you can see it in what they're doing in Bakhmut. I think you can see it in uh, their outreach to Iran. Uh, and now trying to forge some sort of transactional relationship where Iran actually gets uh, access to Russian military capabilities. I can see it, uh, the outreach to North Korea for artillery. And of course, this meeting in Moscow, uh, which make no mistake, Mr. Putin was hoping would lead to additional support from, uh, from China. You can see it in what Mr. Putin is doing. The fact that he goes to Mariupol on the eve of President Xi's visit. What is that other than uh, trying to cast some sort of signal that, that he's large and in charge there and that uh, President Xi should take note of that? You can see in what Mr. Putin is doing that he knows he's having resource difficulties uh, because of what he's blown through over the last year in terms of actual ammunition and missiles, uh, the tanks and aircraft he's lost, uh, and absolutely the, 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 the soldiers. That, that he is literally uh, thrown into a meat grinder uh, and continues to do so. By his own actions, you can see very well that he knows uh, that he's got shortage issues and he's trying to overcome them. And that's another reason why, quite frankly, we don't want to see a ceasefire right now. Because a ceasefire right now, freezing the lines where they are, basically gives him the time and space he needs to try to uh, re-equip, to reman, to make up for the, that resource <laughs> expenditure. The ammunition issue, or do you choose not to in, in front of the world? I choose not to in front of the world. Okay, last question. Thank you. Uh, two, if I may. Um, on this U.S. claim to uh, have intelligence that China has been considering providing <laughs> lethal aid to the Russians, uh, and without expecting you to divulge classified information here, can you at least say that you have any insights or some window onto? Uh, what kind of lethal aid the Chinese have been considering providing? No, I'm not going to go there, James. You don't know? I'm not going to go there. My second question. I want to draw on your long experience in the Navy and in the national security apparatus. Uh, you've served, I don't know how many administrations. How many administrations? Well, over the course of my entire Navy career? Everything. Oh, gosh, I don't know. Six or seven, probably. So um, I wonder if you could share with us any observations you might have uh, as to the current Commander-in-Chief and whether you observe anything distinct or unique about how he approaches the central business of the presidency, which is decision-making. Uh, James, I don't know that that's a fair question for me. I'm just, the, I'm just a guy talking for the NSC up here. But um, look, I, I, didn't, I didn't know the president before I, I, I took this job. Uh, but I've since got a chance to get to know him. And I'll tell you, his fine feel and touch particularly on issues of foreign policy and national security, is very, very distinct. And he asks great questions. Uh, there's not a, a single engagement that I've ever had with him where he wasn't pushing and pressing and wanting more detail and wanting a, a deeper level of context. He thinks these things through carefully. And I can tell you, this I know for sure, certainly, because of my job at the Pentagon, too, before I came here, uh, that when it comes to putting America's men and women in uniform in harm's way, you won't find a, a, another commander in chief who thinks more carefully, deliberately, uh, and consciously uh, about that than President Biden. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Admiral. Okay. I know folks have to gather at like 4:15, so we try to do this super quick. 
Uh, as you just heard from the president earlier uh, this afternoon, this administration is taking historic action to protect our nation's most cherished landscapes. Today, President Biden established two new national monuments, the Awi Kau Mei National Monument in Nevada, also known as the Spirit Mountain and the Kastner Range National Mountain in Texas. Monument, pardon me, monument in Texas. Together, these new monuments protect our over half a million acres of public lands that honor a tribal site and our military veterans. In addition, the President directed the Secretary of Commerce to consider initiating a new National Marine Sanctuary designation to protect all U.S. waters around the Pacific Remote Island. These actions continue to deliver on the most ambitious land and water conservation agenda in American history. In his first year in office, President Biden has protected more lands and waters than any president since JFK. Over the last two years, he has secured the largest investment in climate, environmental justice, and conservation ever. And he has put the entire U.S. Arctic Ocean off limits to new oil and gas development. President Biden's aggressive climate agenda could not come, could not come at a more important time. Yesterday, the United Nations issued a sobering report on the state of our climate, underscoring the critical importance of President Biden's climate leadership at home and also abroad. Now, remember, when President Biden came into office, he talked about how climate change was one of the most important crises that we needed to address. And that's what you've seen from him over the last two years. He rejoined the Paris Agreement and rallied more than 100 countries to join the Global Methane Pledge to reduce methane emissions. He secured the most ambitious climate legislation which has sparked a clean energy manufacturing and jobs boom here at home while accelerating the, jo the global clean energy race abroad. He put the United States back on track to reach its clean energy goals, reducing U.S. greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030 and reaching net zero goals. And on the president's watch, EV sales has tripled and domestic solar capacity is on track to increase five times by next year. But here's the thing, MAGA House Republicans want to reverse that progress. They want to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act, which is helping Americans save on solar panels, electric vehicles, energy efficient windows, and so much more. And, and the extreme MAGA Freedom Caucus is proposing draconian budget cuts that will raise costs for, for hard working families. The House Republican proposal will increase health care premiums by an average of 800 bucks per year for nearly 15 million Americans, eliminate Pell Grants altogether for 80,000 students, and reduce the maximum Pell Grant by nearly $1,000 for, for the remaining 6.6 .6 million students, cut child care access, access for 100,000 children, cut vital nutrition assistance for 1.2 million women, infants, and children, and as we said yesterday, the MAGA Republicans' proposal will be a five-alarm fire for hard-working families. While President Biden is focused on giving those families more breathing room, MAGA congressional Republicans will, would increase cost and worsen inflation. And with that, hello, Josh. Hi, how are you? Good Great. to see you. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday, indeed. Uh, two questions. Sure. Uh, today, Treasury Secretary Yellen said the federal government could step in to protect depositors at banks if there is a risk of contagion. What does the administration think about that risk of contagion? Is that about fundamentals in the economy or the psychology of the markets? So as you mentioned, uh, Secretary Yellen was at the American Bankers Association and she delivered uh, remarks uh, early this morning. And as she said, just want to quote her for a second, the federal government delivered uh, decisive and forceful actions to strengthen public uh, confidence in the U.S. banking system and protect American economy. And that's what you've seen from this administration about almost two weeks ago when they stepped in uh, when uh, when we saw this uh, the this crisis happening. But our focus has been very clear. The president's focus on this has been very clear, which is strengthening and strengthening the banking system and protecting depositors. That has been what has been the forefront of the minds of the federal regulators and also uh, the Department of Sec uh, Department of Treasury. And there's evidence our actions are indeed working. Uh, they're restoring confidence in the safety of deposits. Treasury has said 
deposit uh, has seen deposit flows stabilize, which is incredibly important in regional and also small banks, in some cases, uh, mostly uh, mostly reverse. And so that has been the focus of this administration for the past 10 plus days. And then uh, secondly, the Los Angeles School District, the second largest in the country, is shut down for a three day strike. Should school staff be paid more money? So look, and uh, you know, we've talked about this before. We respect uh, the process and employ employees right to engage in protected concerted act activities. That is something uh, you hear the president talk about how he supports uh, the collective bargaining process and that is something that he will continue to do. Uh, we urge both sides uh, to work in good faith toward a mutually acceptable solution so that there can be uh, a quick resolution and the kids and school employees uh, can get back to where they want to be, which is in schools, especially the kids. And we, the president, uh, as you've heard him say, this is incredibly important to him, making sure that kids uh, get uh, uh, go back to school and get their education. Uh, to follow up on Josh's first question, can you insure all deposits in the U.S. banking system, and do you need legislation for that? So look, um, there are many things, and I have talked about this. Uh, that uh, well, let me step back. Uh, you know. The president and the administration, they took quick uh, quick action uh, uh, when, when this happened a couple of uh, days ago. And uh, of course, there's things that Congress can do. Uh, we've talked about how the president has already called for Congress to, to make it easier for regulators to claw back compensation, impose civil penalties, and ban executives from working in the banking industry. So that's something that we've asked for. Uh, but as I was mentioning a, a moment ago, there are quite a bit that we can do without Congress. And this is what you have asked. We've, the president has asked regulators to do uh, in the last two years, uh, to take actions over uh, over the last few years to reverse uh, the last administration's deregulation, which we know happened back in 2018, uh, after the Ob Obama-Biden administration uh, put in stronger, strengthening those, uh, strengthening regulations back after, um, uh, after what we saw in 2008. Uh, so look, we don't want to let Congress off the hook. Uh, we want Congress to continue to, to certainly uh, to take action, and so we're going to call on them to do just that. Adam yeah, Green, I know the this White House doesn't weigh in on the Fed's policy deliberations, so not asking you to do that. But just in the bigger picture, can you give us a sense of how the White House is watching Jerome Powell's statement tomorrow, as well as the interest rate decision that is coming? Look, I just want to be very, very careful here. Uh, I'm just going to go back to what we have said many times. The Fed, the Fed is indeed independent. Uh, we want to give them the space uh, to make those monetary decisions, uh, and uh, I'm just not. I don't want to get ahead of that. I don't even want to. I don't even want to give any thoughts uh, to what they might, what uh, Jerome Powell might say tomorrow. I just want to be really, really mindful and careful here. Totally different topic. Um, does President Biden believe that it is appropriate for a person who is indicted to run for office? So, nice way to ask, MJ. Very clever. Um, so, I'm going to be, uh, again, really careful for here, from here as it relates to uh, any upcoming elections, and, and specifically, uh, I'm assuming you're, you're talking about the 2024 election. We just, I'm just not going to give in any analysis, uh, any um, uh, foresight, any, any type of um, kind of decision or thoughts on that, uh, because we are covered by the Hatch Act, so I'm not going to speak to politics, and I'm just going to leave it, from, leave it there. Um, has the president seen the video that seems to show the moments during and after Ivo Otieno was uh, died while in law enforcement custody at Virginia's Central State Hospital? Has he been briefed on this? Yeah, we've seen, uh, we've definitely seen the reports. Um, I know the president has been tracking this. Look, I've, I said this um, last week when I was asked uh, by the Grio, by um, I believe by um, uh, April Ryan, uh, our hearts certainly uh, go to uh, go out to the family on this devastating, uh, devastating event that occurred. Uh, the president is indeed, he saw the reports. Uh, we've been uh, paying attention to the reports. We're just going to be incredibly mindful uh, on speaking on this as there's a uh, current investigation. And have you been in touch with the OTM family? I, I don't have a, a call. We don't have a call to preview or to speak to at this time, but Clearly, um, uh, this is, uh, it was devastating, again, what we saw in our hearts go out to the family. Okay, Justin. Uh, thanks. I just wanted to follow up on Steve's question. Um, and in your answer, you highlighted the President's past actions, you said Congress shouldn't be off the hook, but you today and yesterday avoided talking about what, if any, unilateral actions that the President, considering going forward to sort of stabilize 
financial system, and I'm wondering what the strategy is there, especially after we saw the sort of robust response a little over a week ago. Is it because you think the crisis is over, that you're worried that talking about what you're talking about could, could fuel the panic? Is it that you want to set a precedent ahead of the debt ceiling fight of not really entertaining unorthodox solutions? Is it com a combination of those th three so, things? No, totally understand the question. Look, when it comes to specifics about the debt ceiling and, and, um, and all of those things, that's something that Treasury certainly and the, the Secretary has spoken to this uh, many times. I would say that, um, and, and I'll quote her here, uh, the actions we have taken, uh, this is from the Secretary, uh, to protect depositors and the stability of the banking system have not affected the X date uh, for the debt limit. So just want to reiterate that from uh, from the Secretary. Um, look, uh, you know, as, as it, uh, you know, if we're worried about unorthodox uh, uh, interventions? No, we're not. We are going to use uh, every tool that we have to make sure that the American people uh, have the confidence. That's what we've been uh, trying to work through these last uh, almost two weeks, is that making sure that they feel that their deposits will be safe and will be uh, there when they need it. And that's what's important uh, in the actions and what the President has asked the regulators uh, to do and also the, the Treasury Department to do. So it's fair to say that those conversations are ongoing, but but you don't necessarily want to detail them because of the content. Well, I mean, comment. this is something that lives in the Treasury uh, Department. This is something that they have been tasked with uh, as it relates to dealing with this issue that we have seen. Uh, that, that's the directive uh, that the President has given the Secretary and the regulators. So that lives there. So that's something that I would, uh, that's why I'm referring you to them. But we are going to do everything that we can to use the tools that are given to us uh, to make sure that, again, that the American people feel confidence, and they should, right? That's kind of what you heard from the Secretary uh, today, that we see a stabilizing, uh, that the banking, uh, uh, the banking system is resilient. And a lot of that is because of the work uh, that this president has done. I know you've, you've, you've mentioned the current things that he's doing, but let's not forget uh, what occurred in the Obama-Biden uh, administration and how we, they were able to strengthen that, uh, the regulations. And so that work will continue. Uh, and But again, we can't lift Congress off the hook. Uh, they have to take some actions as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, go ahead. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes. uh, we know that Chicago, Atlanta, and New York City are in the running for the Democratic Convention, and ultimately the decision is up to President Biden. Uh, what are the factors he's looking for, and will the whole city be announced before the President makes his second term announcement official, or is the timing not related? Okay, so first let me say, on the, let me answer your, your last question first, which is the President has said many times that he intends to run. I'm not going to go beyond that. Uh, that is uh, for the president to decide clearly. And look, that question that you just asked me is a is a political question that that lives with um, with the DNC, the, ne the Democratic National Committee. So that I would refer you to uh, to them. Uh, but you know, all of all, all of us are probably tracking that a decision hasn't made, been made on that front. Uh, again, that's for the DNC to decide. Uh, but just like uh, many of you, all of you here, we will all find out at the same time uh, which city uh, gets chosen. I just can't speak to this to that from here. I wasn't asking about the DNC. Oh, okay. I was asking because. The DNC does the vetting and the yep. Skype selection, but then they give a recommendation to the president, who is the decider, just like when the primary happened, the news came out from him. So that's why I'm asking you a little bit more how this may Well, the president out. is the leader of the Democratic Party, but from here, I cannot talk about politics, so that's why I'm referring you to the DNC. Uh, go ahead, Alex. Um, three, uh, San Francisco just held a hearing on uh, reparations for you know, decades of, of institutional uh, racism, and um, you know, other cities and states are considering, uh, you know, impaneling similar commissions. DC is one of them. Where does this administration stand on reparations for um, slavery and segregation and similar uh, historic wrongs, uh, specifically pertaining to Black Americans? So look, uh, we understand that there's a legislation on the Hill currently 
uh, on this on the study of repara uh, reparations, pardon me, and we think Congress is the uh, the appropriate venue for consideration consideration on such action, uh, and so we're going to leave it there for Congress to decide to let them go through their process uh, that they're taking at this moment. But I would I would lay out uh, and speak to what the president has done over the last two years. When he came into office, he talked about the different crises that this country is dealing with, and one of them was racial equity uh, and racial equality and fighting for that uh, for uh, for communities like the, the, the black community. And one of the things that he did right away, straight away in the beginning of his administration, is he signed an executive order uh, that uh, uh, that uh, made sure that across the, across the governor, government that we had an approach that dealt with inequality, that we had that made sure that um, uh, that that uh, political appointees in in those agencies uh, put that any put that equality lens as they were moving forward with dealing with policy and so that's in, that's important in in really getting to the root uh, of, uh, of that issue clearly that's on the federal level and um, and just last month he issued a second order reaffirming the administration's commitment to deliver on that equity. Uh, so the president has shown his commitment. He's spoken uh, to this issue that, uh, that uh, in particular, this black the, the black community has to deal with for generations upon generations. So he uh, is going to continue to lift that up. But as it relates to the legislation, uh, we, are, we want to leave that in the hands of Congress. OK, Courtney. Thanks, Green. I wanted to ask uh, about the Supreme Court, the American Bar Association a resolution urging the Supreme Court justices to agree to an ethics code, mm -hmm. given how consequential their decisions have been over the last year and their bills in Congress considering this. What's the president's position on a mandatory code of ethics for the highest court? So I'm just not going to speak to that from here. Um, I, that is something for uh, SCOTUS uh, to, to work through and to speak to. I'm just not going to make a comment from here about that. Yes, when the teacher was here, the president said he looked forward to going to Ireland to celebrate the Good Friday <laughs> Agreement. Uh, yes. The actual anniversary is less than three weeks away. Can you give us a sense of where things are in the planning for this trip and when we might get a formal announcement of it? It's a good question. Um, and so, you know, um, I don't have anything more to share. Uh, any plans to go to Northern Ireland and the Republic uh, to acknowledge the anniversary of a Good Friday Accord. Uh, the president said he looks forward to doing that, uh, but we're still in process of hammering out uh, what uh, what those details will be. And as soon as we have more information, uh, uh, we'll, we'll certainly share that, understanding that that's three weeks away. But as the president said, he's looking forward to it. Hi. Are you new, to, you're new to the room? Yes, Ali Rafa with NBC. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Earlier this month, uh, President Biden said he spoke with the family of Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell after his fall. Has the president spoken directly with Leader McConnell since then? Um, don't have any um, any conversations to read out at this time. Yes, the president. Um, uh, called the family of Leader uh, Leader McConnell, clearly wish wishing him a speedy recovery, which we continue to do. I uh, just don't have anything beyond what we uh, what we laid out a couple weeks ago. Okay. Go ahead, Thanks, Karine. I wanted to ask you about some <coughs> comments by the president of Mexico, mm -hmm. who's been very critical of the administration recently. Just today, he suggested that the U.S. Uh, had blown up the Nord Stream pipeline. Suggested the administration was trying to derail Donald Trump ahead of the 2024 election. And then recently he said that fentanyl is a U.S. problem, not a Mexican problem. This, of course, is, comes just a couple of months after the two leaders met in Mexico City. I'm wondering what this says about U.S. Mexico relations, how you go forward when he's, you know, when you say these kinds of things. Well, you said a couple things that I want to address. Um, clearly, the first two are not true. Um, and, uh, uh, um, and so I'm just going to put that on the record. Uh, as it r relates to the fentanyl, uh, this, is, this is not a U.S. problem. Uh, it's a global one. The trafficking of illicit drugs is causing a societal, societal damage, needless death and suffering, and not just here, but also in Mexico. And so, uh, you know, we want to be really mindful about that. Uh, uh, Dr. Liz Sherwood Randall, recently the, the President's Homeland Security Advisor and other high-level uh, U.S. delegation, they went, they were in Mexico, and they, they discussed concrete opportunities to detect uh, and, dis and um, uh, disrupt and prosecute those who manufacturing and traffic fentanyl. And that is a conversation, a delegation that went to Mexico to have uh, this conversation. Uh, and so, you know, just want to be really clear about that because that is something that, when we think about fentanyl, is something that is affecting uh, many communities. Um, look, 
We see our relationship with Mexico a vital one, an important one. They are a close neighbor. Uh, as you just mentioned, the president was just recently uh, in Mexico City in January uh, to do the summit, uh, not just with the president of Mexico, but also the prime minister of Canada. You saw them. They had a, a very good, uh, very good summit, uh, uh, um, you know, good discussion bilaterally when they had that opportunity during the summit. And so we're going to try and continue uh, to grow to grow that relationship. But, you know, I'm certainly going to speak out and, and make sure we correct the record on some of the things that have just been said. Get it, Molly. Thanks, Green. Uh, you spoke about that sobering UN climate report earlier. Has the president read the report, been briefed on the report? That's a good question. I, I would have to ask to see if the president uh, has been briefed on the report. I don't, don't have an answer for you at this time. Well, you also talked about, you know, the steps this administration has taken on the issue of climate change. But this report indicates that what's being done so far is not enough to, you know, avert these catastrophic temperatures. Does the administration feel that enough action can be taken in time to avert the Earth from reaching this? It's, it's a great question, and what I will say to that is this is why the president has made climate change, uh, tackling climate change, a priority. And this is why he has done more on climate change and protecting uh, the climate and reversing, uh, trying to reverse the damage that we have seen. Uh, uh, he's made that a priority, and he's taken more actions than any other president. The re his record speaks for that. Uh, there's always more work that needs to be done. Uh, and so the president is going to continue to focus on, on all the things that we can do to deal with this issue. And at the top, I laid out uh, the, different, uh, the, different, um, uh, the different actions the president has taken, uh, and clearly uh, we're going to continue uh, to, uh, to move forward. But uh, again, yes, does more work to be, need to be done? Absolutely. And that's why the president has made this uh, a priority. One of the crises that he mentioned, uh, one of the four crises that he mentioned when he walked into this administration, and took action uh, right away. And so that's that's going to continue. He's never going to back down. I have to wrap. Okay, last question. Uh, on the climate announcements today, Nevada Governor Joe Lombardo put out a statement saying that they were not consulted on the Abiquamea site uh, and that he opposes it being designated as a national monument. Um, it, did the White House consult the governor? And if not, why not? So um, I, I don't have any um, meetings to work to talk through or, or conversations. Um, so, look, I mean, this is something that I was saying before. This is the president that has taken an aggressive stand on climate uh, and made this a priority. Uh, this is the most engaged, when you think about um, uh, the engagement that we have seen uh, on this issue, is, an, is it important? Uh, because there's still much more that needs to be done uh, to tackle this climate crisis. Uh, and so we're going to continue to do the work. Uh, I can't speak to any conversation that has been had uh, 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 with the governor, but I can say that the president is taking, uh, taking uh, his, um, uh, taking, tackling the climate crisis uh, as, a, as a priority. And we're doing uh, we're doing the work like no other president has done, uh, and so we're going to continue continue to move forward on doing that. Does the president usually consult governors on these kinds of decisions. The president and uh, and his office of uh, uh, intergovernmental affairs, which deals with the governors and deals with mayors and also local uh, elected officials, is in constant communications uh, with uh, with uh, with in, into your question with governors. I just don't have a, a, a readout to give you on that particular conversation or engagement. All right, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Jeremy.